Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is a show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your faithful host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Chock full of all kinds of great stories, reviews, fun lists, everything funky and fun. Get your copy, give one for a gift. Whether you're watching to the YouTube channel or on funkinstuff.net, or also on Daily Motion or Vimeo, or listening to the podcast audio version on iTunes, Spotify, all kinds of leading providers. Thank you, as always, very much for your continued interest and support in the program. Speaking of which, if you like what you see, like what you hear, want to support this program, help keep the lights on, then you can donate. You can contribute a little to the funk, to truth and rhythm, to the jazz, R&B artists. I mean, it's not going to them. It's helping support the show. Um, but by extension, it supports those artists and their legacies and their stories. So anything you can give is much appreciated. Go to the funkstuff.net site. On the right-hand side of the page, there's a link to follow. It's easy and much appreciated. On to the show. This episode features one of the most recorded guitarists in the world, Mr. Paul Jackson Jr. Also an accomplished producer, composer, and arranger, Jackson spent a decade as an ace session player, lending his highly in-demand skills to an astounding roster of respected and iconic music stars spanning the genres of jazz, pop, R&B, and beyond before he launched his successful solo career in the late 1980s as a jazz R&B fusionist. His varied albums typically check all the jazz, funk, and R&B boxes with tasty and nimble solos throughout. Though he never got to meet or work with one of his chief guitar and musical influences, Wes Montgomery, Jackson has forged professional relationships with all the others who touched his formative years. Those include Earl Clue, George Benson, Ray Parker Jr., George Duke, Earth, Wind & Fire's Al McKay, and Lee Ridenour, as well as his mentor, Patrice Russian. He has also appeared in the recordings of superstars like Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Elton John, Barbara Streisand, Celine Dion, Quincy Jones, Luther Vandross, Ella Fitzgerald, Natalie Cole, B.B. King, Kenny Rogers, Al Jarreau, Stanley Clark, Joe Sample, Barry White, Chicago, and so many others. More recently, Jackson contributed his talents to a Daft Punk album that won five Grammy Awards and was, a, and was number one in 104 countries. Jackson also released eight albums under his own name, including his debut, I Came to Play, in 1988, Never Alone Duets in 1996, and most recently, Stories from Stompin' Willie. The latter was a tribute to his deceased friend and musical giant, George Duke. And the highly funky album includes several remakes of Duke's works. In 2018, Jackson joined prolific keyboardist Jeff Lorber's funk soul jazz trio with the terrific Life in Times having dropped earlier this year and the group hitting stages in its support. In addition, Jackson has appeared on many TV shows and specials, including Martin, Don't Forget the Lyrics, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and American Idol. Jackson covers most of those experiences in this in-depth Truth and Rhythm interview. He digs deep into his playing techniques, unforgettable memories, recording some of contemporary music's greatest songs, working with famed artists, stories around his own releases, spirituality and faith, just about everything in between, and even the fantastic thing just around the corner. Now, let's get in session with one of the most ubiquitous session players of them all, Paul Jackson Jr., or as George Duke nicknamed him, Stompin' Willie. All that and much more just ahead. Welcome to the show. Enjoy. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Studio, one of popular music's most in-demand session players and a distinguished recording artist in his own right. 
I'm talking about jazz, R&B, guitarist, producer, composer, and arranger, Mr. Paul Jackson Jr. Paul, how are you today? I'm great, Scott. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for joining the program. Good, good, good. I, I see you have a Lakers hat on, so keep hope alive. <laughs> I have. You know, I'm a, a native uh, Angelino, so uh, I've been away from there for about 10 years, but uh, it's been a rough 10 years since I left. I feel like I took the good basketball with me. I, I think you did. I think you left and you took all the all the all the the, the gusto with you. So uh, so uh, like I said, keep hope alive, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> this, this year. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we may we may buy our way to winning something here. It, it could happen. It could happen. Yeah. So obviously you're in Los Angeles, and you're a native as well, or? Yep, born and raised in uh, South Central. Los Angeles, been here all my life and still live here. Nice. Um, so as I mentioned before we started, I'm a big fan going back to, you know, it seemed like every record I bought in the early 80s, mid 80s, late 80s had Paul Jackson Jr. on there. And then, you know, when you came out with your own records in the late 80s, starting with I Came to Play and I was a DJ and a music journalist at the time. And so, you know, it's a thrill to get to talk to you and find out some of those stories as we go through the show. Cool. Sounds good. Well, I'm happy to be here and fire away. I'm good to go. All right, cool. Plenty of coffee and... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Paul, how did you first get into guitar and into jazz? And you know, what's your musical foundation? Well, the reason I started to play the guitar is because my mom, in her infinite wisdom, would not buy me a set of drums. Uh, we went to Gardena Valley Music when I was a kid. And there was a drum set. I wanted to play drums. And in the window, there was a Metal Flake Blue drum set. I don't remember the brand, but I remember the price. It was $369. And my mom looked at me and said, this is not going to happen. Hmm. However, we walked into the store and she said, is there anything else in here that you see that you like? And there was a $20 guitar hanging from the ceiling. And the rest, shall we say, is history. But that's how I started studying. I uh, started studying with a guy by the name of Gary Bell when I was 12 years old, and he taught me a lot of techniques and all of my chords and then chord substitutions and then how to play jazz and how to do a chord melody and a little bit about classical and things like that. So I owe a lot of my success really to my parents, their sacrifice for giving me lessons, and also to Gary Bell for really pouring into me everything that he had. Uh, when I was 16, I started studying classical with a buddy of mine by the name of Greg Perre who we actually I went on to later score television shows with, and he really introduced me to classical. And I owe a lot also to Patrice Russian, who put me in her band when I graduated from high school, and you know she taught me even more. And interesting fact is right now I'm teaching at the University of Southern California. I'm an adjunct professor there in the pop department under Patrice Russian. So several years later, she is still my boss. I still call her my boss. She's always been my boss my entire life. So she is still my boss, and uh, so it's been it's been a long time coming. But just you know, uh, I, I consider myself the perpetual student because music is something that you'll never master. There's always something to learn. So, but yeah, it started when I was a kid because of my mom and and her infinite wisdom. And did you have any uh, other musicians in the family, or um, you know, was 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 there sort of an innate talent in the bloodline, or? Well, let's see. My brother plays keyboards, and my sister is a percussionist. She's a percussionist with the Southwest Symphony, and and uh, so we all played instruments. And then we had a family band, and you know we play weddings and parties and dances, and and then buddies would join. Uh, we'd had different iterations of the band when bass player buddies would join or, or other folks, and so uh, yeah, there was there was always music at the house. And I want to uh, state early on here that I don't want Paul Jackson Jr. to get confused with Paul Jackson, the bass player from Headhunters and all that. I'm sure, uh, you know, that happens a lot, especially in Google searches. But, uh, yeah, I think he's about 10 years your senior. So About 13 years or so, at least. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, about between 10 and 13 years. Interesting story. His name is also Paul Jackson Jr. His middle initial is J. Mine is M. But he never used the junior, which is why I did. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, you know, you had this training and you've got your chops together. And um, what were some of your earliest influences in terms of, you know, guys we would know as, as players? Oh, you know, 
lots of guys you know, like Earl Clue and George Benson and Wes Montgomery, Lee Rittenauer. And then on the rhythm side, a lot Al McKay, who at that time was with Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, before that Watts 100, uh, Charles Wright and the Watts 100 Third Street Rhythm Band, and also to a large degree, Ray Parker Jr. Mm -hmm. um, and at what point, you know, did you sort of start getting out on stage? Uh, was that an easy thing for you to do, or were you kind of, you know, just wanting to play and not be in the limelight? Or? Well, you know, it's still not an easy thing to do. Um, I don't take it for granted that I get to do it. In fact, I'm in a group now, that, as you know, with Jeff Lorber and Everett Hart called Jazz Fun Soul, and we just played Yoshi's this weekend in Oakland. And uh, it's never an easy thing for me to do in terms of uh, I always want to play better than I did before or do something that I didn't do. And I'm always probably uh, not my own worst enemy. I don't think that, but my own worst critic in that, you know, it's like, okay, Paul, play something else, play something different, play something better. So, uh, but, you know, that's that's been my entire career for some 40 years or so, a little over 40 years. And, um, you know, I think when you kind of feel like, okay, this is second nature is when things start to decline. You know, so it, I hope it never gets to be second nature for me. What do you enjoy more, the lead runs or the rhythm playing or what part really does it for you? I like it all. I like recording here. I like playing live. Uh, I, I like teaching, which is interesting. I, I didn't know that I would like teaching as much as I do. So I, I like it all. I like discovering new things. I like discovering new music, discovering new equipment. So, I mean, I get excited about because there's so much to music. There's always, I like listening to other guys. Um, Russell Malone, I'm a big fan of Russell Malone, and, and he and I are Facebook friends, and, and I, you know, gotten to play with him a couple of times. And, and uh, so it all excites me, listening to other people, finding out stuff. So I, it's, it's just an exciting profession for me, an exciting call. Well, it's very cool to see you're still, still so passionate about it all these years later. Oh, yeah. You know, there's, there's so much to learn, man. so much to learn. What might be going through your head during one of your solos? Interesting. Making all the changes, um, timing, phrasing, sound, presentation. Um, it's one thing to, to have something that you like. It's another thing to get it off the stage and out to the people for whom you're performing. So for me, I'd say that's one of the challenges is to make sure that what I'm playing doesn't isn't just between me and the guitar in a live situation, but it's between myself and the people who have come to see me play. So that that's a bit of a challenge, but I'm thinking about, you know, presentation, phrasing, sound, note choice, all those kind of things, you know. What about uh, your choice of tone or, um you know, attack on a particular song? How do you generally arrive at those? I take it on a song by song basis. It's, it's an individual thing. There's, there really is no such thing as a one size fits all rhythm part or lead tone or whatever. It, you have to take everything on an individual basis. And uh, depending on the situation, you know, sometimes you have to work within the confines of equipment. Like for instance, in a live show, I'm, if I can avoid it, I'm not going to change guitars needlessly. You know, uh, when we were doing American Idol, obviously there were lots of different tones, so there were lots of different guitars, but I had time to change. But, um, so everything is on a song by song basis. Basis. What was your first professional gig? My first professional gig was doing a session for Jimmy the Preacher Robbins when I was 16 years old. My guitar teacher, Gary Bell, let me borrow his vintage Telecaster and go to the studio and work for an organ player named Jimmy the Preacher Robbins. That was probably my first set real session. And what year about was that? 76. Okay. Yeah. And th then how did things progress from there? How did you sort of rise up and, and get start getting so much regular work? Well, that session was pretty much a disaster. It, it went pretty, <laughs> well, part of it went really well, part of it didn't go well at all, but that's okay. So fast forward a couple of years, I was uh, met a guy by the name of Frank Wilson. If you Google Frank Wilson, he was one of the original Motown writers and wrote things like Keep on Truckin', Son of Sagittarius, I'm Gonna Make You Love Me, You Make Me So Very Happy, so a bunch of hits. So he had left Motown and he was um, you know, producing other projects. Now back then, there was no Pro Tools, there was no Logic, there was no Ableton Live, there was no digital recording. Uh, so every song had to be demoed. 
before, you know, so people could present it to artists. So I would do demos for him when I was 16, 17 years old. And then when I was 18, he started using me on actual uh, records. At the same time, uh, I had met Lee Rittenauer and Ray Parker Jr. and Al McKay, and they started sending me on their overflow work because Ray was busy with radio, Lee was busy with his solo career, and Al McKay was very busy with Earth, Wind & Fire. So they would start to send me on some of their overflow gigs. And, you know, the Lord blessed, and, and I was able to kind of start to move into, into doing regular recording. How accomplished did you feel you were at that point in your career, in terms of your, your ability? Oh, not at all. I, you know, I was, I, you know, I was, I was green as an unripe banana, you know, and, uh, but I had a lot of people who took me under their wing, like the late great Wawa Watson and, uh, and obviously Ray and, and, um, Jay Graydon and great keyboard players like Sonny Burke and Clarence McDonald and who would kind of show me the ropes and show me what to do and what not to do. People like David T. Walker, people like Charles Fearing, all these people who were doing sessions kind of, you know, schooled me to, you know, things that would have things I needed to know, things I needed to learn, things I needed to expect. I remember once I was doing a date for a session for uh, Gene Page, and I believe it was a Johnny Mathis session. And uh, he had on the, on the master rhythm chart, he had written the guitar rhythms and the staff right between the treble and bass uh, staffs. And so I, I played what he wrote. And so after we were done, I said, uh, hey, Gene, why did you write that part? He says, oh, well, what I wrote was what I thought Ray would have played, Ray Parker Jr., because Ray had recommended me to Gene. I said, oh, great. You know, but that was something I had never seen before, but it was neat because, and I could read well, so I was able to read it and figure out, you know, what he wanted. And so that was, you know, those are the type of things that I learned uh, on the job, but also, you know, from, like I said, the, the, um, the people I mentioned, uh, like for instance, Wawa showed me really about the concept of space and, and call and response with respects to, um, to, uh, making a song feel good. So, you know, things like that you learn from listening and from, and from taking instruction from the guys that were doing it all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was uh, trying to go after him for this show, right. When he passed like a year ago or so, I was so, yeah. so saddened by that. Um, great, great player. So how did you go about cultivating your own style? Well, um, just kind of writing songs. And uh, uh, once again, Mr. Ray Parker Jr. said, hey, Paul, are you serious about this? He said, yeah. He said, well, you should get some recording equipment and start recording, start writing songs. So I took every dime I had and I bought a tape machine and a little console and started writing and writing and writing. And around 19... 87, I had written a song, the song I came to play, which was heard by Sylvia Rohn, which led to a record deal. And so uh, me feeling like, okay, well, I'm not George Benson and I'm not Earl Clue and I, you know, hadn't planned on going this direction, but, you know, this is the way the Lord has taken me. So I said, okay, great, let's go for it. And just, you know, and so now I just look to, even now, just look to play better and, and, uh, and, and as, as another person who was my godfather, Guy Helpful, uh, Mr. Ndugu Chancellor said, play like Paul Jackson Jr. I remember once I was talking to Ndugu and uh, I said, man, when can I do some gigs with you? When can I play in your band? He said, when you learn to play like Paul Jackson Jr. So I was like, okay, I'm not sure what that means, but I'm going to find out what that means and go figure it out. And so a couple of years later, I joined his band and he told the audience, I, said, I asked him to join when he figured out how to play like Paul Jackson Jr. So it's, it's an ongoing process. It's a continual process where you're always working on being the best Paul Jackson Jr. you can be. So uh, I would say I, I haven't really fully learned it yet. So uh, it's, it's, it's ever evolving, ever increasing, and hopefully uh, getting better and better. So, What about all those years prior to that, you know, all the session work? Um, is it possible to carve out a bit of your own signature as a session player? Uh, I think so. I think what happens is when you're fortunate enough to play on on a hit record or a few of them, people have a tendency to say, hey, you know, that worked on this record. Can you give me that or something of that ilk on my record? And so you kind of think back, it's like, okay, what was it that I did that they liked? And so you start to hone in on some things, on um, you know, a certain skill set that you have that seem to work on records. And I shouldn't say parts that work on records, but I should say maybe an approach that works on records. And so that that that's kind of what started happening. 
Well, to give viewers and listeners an idea, you know, I always go and research whoever I'm going to have on. I look at the credits for the career. And I don't think I've ever had anyone on who has more pages of credits than you. I think it was upwards near 50 pages of credits. Oh, wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, I, I think another person I had on that had a ton of credits was Jim uh, Jim Gilstrap, who's oh, been yeah. a singer on so many things, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's that kind of thing. And, um, I mean, you just run the gamut from the jazz guys to the pop to the R&B, um, just so many different genres of music. How have you managed to bridge all of that in your in what you do? Well, I don't approach music as I don't pigeonhole music. Um, I approach everything as music. Everything is a skill set, and everything deserves your full attention and your full commitment. Uh, I was speaking to someone a couple of days ago. Uh, there's a station on Sirius Radio, Sirius XM, called Soul Town, and they play a lot of hits from the '60s and '70s as well as the '80s. And when you listen to some of the guitar parts, you go, what made these guys think of this? You know, and then you realize that all of these guys, these were the groundbreaking years of, of, of R&B, the 50s and, and early 60s. So a lot of these guys were jazz guys. A lot of them were blues guys. A lot of them were gospel guys. And on any given day, a jazz guy would work with a blues guy who worked with a gospel guy. And so because a lot of these guys were jazz guys, they approached it like jazz guys. In fact, uh, Jim, uh, Joe Messina, who was one of the Funk Brothers, played on the Soupy Sales show. And if you see any footage from that, he's playing all these bebop lines and stuff like that to this day. I mean, he's about 85 years old or so. And to this day, you know, he's a, he's a bebop guy. So he brought that influence to Motown. And so um, I don't think that you can pigeonhole music or musicians. I think you develop a skill set and start to incorporate as much knowledge as you can, and I think it intertwines, you know, in in everything else you're doing. I remember doing sessions with James Burton. Well, James Burton obviously, you know, played with Elvis, and so he was known as kind of like the rock and roll, rockabilly country guy. But we do R and B sessions, and so he would infuse whatever it was that he did in that, and the with the goal of just making it feel good. So, so, and and that's really the goal. So you don't pigeonhole music, and you don't pigeonhole musicians. You just acquire knowledge. And keep growing it, and it, it all will infuse in, in basically every type of music you do. That's such an interesting perspective, um, Paul, because the record industry sometimes I think almost approaches it a lot differently from that mm -hmm. you know, in terms of trying to put everything in, in a box and, and all that kind of thing. So um, I imagine I would think it would be challenging to keep that frame of mind, you know, that's sort of counter to what the overall industry is, but a okay. huge value to what you do, obviously. Well, you know, in terms of writing songs and types of songs, obviously there are R&B songs, there are rock and roll songs, there are gospel songs, there, there are country songs. So within genres, obviously there are types of music, but within those genres, there are no jazz chords, there are no funk chords, there are no rock and roll chords, they're just chords, you know? There are no jazz notes, there are, you know, there are really no jazz intervals. There are no funk intervals, you know. So in terms of a skill set as a musician, even within the confines of the different types of songs, you know, you will pull knowledge and experience from every area and infuse it in what you're doing. That's at least that's my opinion. Well, I've always felt that the most interesting music created is that that brings in so many different genres and elements, you know. Yep. That's where you get... The, case, the really innovation. Case, in point, case in point, um, Pain by the Ohio Players, the trumpet solo. If you listen to the trumpet solo, obviously this guy came out of a jazz idiom. Or the saxophone solo by Don Myrick on the live versions of Reason, live version of Reasons. You know, playing bebop licks all day long. But so it was the skill set that he had and the notes and the approach that he had, and I, I don't remember the trumpet player's name in, in Ohio Players, but it's infusing where you came from and what you had into the music that you're playing. I think that was uh, Pee Wee. Okay. Ohio Players. Um, so, but home for you is is jazz, would you say, or what, what are you most, you know, what's your sweet spot? My sweet spot is probably contemporary jazz right now with uh, with bebop overtones. You know, I practice, I practice jazz all the time, you know, and, 
well, I practice everything all the time, but, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a never ending quest. What do you think is the most challenging though, or what has been the most challenging of what you've worked on in your career? Oh, a couple things right now. My biggest challenges, my biggest challenges are playing changes really fast. Um, finger picking a la Doyle Dykes or, uh, Chet Atkins, if you will. Um, and getting back to where I was as a classical musician, because I, I'd gotten uh, pretty good as a classical musician. So getting back to those, those are probably the top three right now. And so that, that and, and lap steel. I was going to say, so you're getting out the acoustic a little more these days? Oh, all the time. It, it never never got put away. But but right now, those are probably my biggest challenges today. And like I said, also, you know, lap steel. I, I did a record for a buddy of mine, Eric Zobler, who um, was George Duke's engineer. And we worked together extensively. So he's producing a project and I'm playing guitars and doing different things. And I said, you know, this needs a lap steel solo. So I pull out a lap steel that I had and, and did okay with it. But I said, you know, I can do this a lot better. So right now that's one of the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this won't embarrass you, Paul, but I want to run through really quick uh, a list of some of the folks that you've recorded with. And okay. then we'll hopefully talk about a couple of them. Um, but going back to the early 80s, Alphonse Muzan, Aretha Franklin, Minnie Ripperton, Lee Oscar, of course, Patrice Russian, The Jacksons, Donna Summer, Joe Sample, um, and then even, you know, pop people like Barry Manilow, Kenny Rogers, um, George Benson, Denise Williams, Philip Bailey, Herb Albert, Michael Jackson, Ray Parker that we already mentioned, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, Deanne Warwick, Natalie Cole, Johnny Mathis, which you mentioned, Whitney Houston, George Duke, which we mentioned, um, Anita Baker, New Edition, and on and on and on. So, wow. Um, can you share with us any particular um, special memories that really jump out or, or, you know, high in your memory banks from some of those uh, sessions with some of those big stars? Well, there were a few good ones, and I'll give you one example. Um... 19 years old recording with Ella Fitzgerald on a record she did of Joe Beam tunes. And so uh, I remember Joe Pass was on there. It was on the date and, and Tony Bennett was there. And so, you know, getting to meet those guys and, you know, uh, music legends and, and getting to play with the music legend herself, Ella Fitzgerald, or doing the solo on this place hotel for the Jacksons, for Michael Jackson, going into the studio and Michael saying, this is what I want you to play, putting in a tape and him singing, the solo note for note that's on the record, you know, so that was, that was pretty amazing. Or recording with uh, the Crusaders when they were producing B.B. Uh, King. So there's a picture actually of myself, Dean Parks, B.B. King and the Crusaders, Joe Sample, Wilton Felder and Sticks Hooper in the studio while we were recording. So, you know, things like that. Um, uh, being on stage with Whitney Houston in South Africa in front of 100,000 people. Um, let's see, uh, being in the studio by myself, coming up with all the, the parts that, that ended up on the song PYT. And uh, my, well, by myself, I mean myself, Quincy and, and Bruce Sweetine. Um, oh gosh, um, gee whiz, I'm trying to think. There have been a lot of them over the years. So those, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. What, what was Quincy like in the studio? What was it like to work with Q? Always fun. Um, he is the master, uh, what I would call, uh, captain of the ship. Because he hires people for what he knows that they can do. And he, he will let you create within the confines of the song. And then he will steer it to where it's supposed to go. Um, well, that was the uh, situation when we were working on the Thriller record. You know, we'd come in and, and play, and then he'd steer it to where he wanted to go. Another memorable time. Uh, we were working on the song, How Do You Keep the Music Playing, with James Ingram and Patty Austin. And the rhythm section was Nathan East, Robbie, B uh, sorry, Nathan East, David Foster, uh, Indugu Chancellor, and myself. And I'll never forget, and it's on the record if you listen, going into the last chorus, there's a drum fill where uh, Indugu played the tom, do, do, do. Doom, do, 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 crashed the cymbals, stood up, 
grabbed the symbol and sat back down and did not miss a backbeat. <laughs> and so things like that. And that was on a Quincy date. So he just let you create, which was always amazing. Did he require you to do a lot of takes? Mm, not, I don't, no, not a lot of takes, you know, maybe two or three, you know, four at the most. I mean, you know, he, he's the type of person that was always listening. And so he knew when he had it, you know, versus a guy like, for instance, um, Michael Masser, who wrote The Greatest Love of All, <clears throat> who would do take after take after take in different keys with different modulations. Different approach, but I think it's the same mindset. I think a producer's job is to know in his heart of hearts when he has it, whatever it is, when he has it, to know that he has it. So there are different approaches and, and different methods of getting that, but I think it's the same mindset. Who's a person or persons that you got in the studio with and you're just like, wow, this person is unbelievable? Oh, Michael Jackson was that way. George Benson was that way. Stanley Clark. Every time I worked with George Duke, um, um, the producers, David Gampson, who started out with Creedy Politi and then went on to produce, uh, you know, Shaka Khan and a lot of the records. Arif Mardin was that way. Um, Daft Punk, the guys in Daft Punk, uh, similar situation, just blown away by their approach. So it's been different people over the years. What qualities do you think are most important in being a really sort of go-to session guy? I think the most important quality is assimilation. And by that, I mean assimilation and interpretation. The idea is to assimilate the song or, or understand where the song is going and coming up with parts, a part or parts that will enhance the song quickly. Um, you know, you, you may not have, well, you won't have five or six hours to come up with a part for one song. You might have 15 minutes. And so the idea is to, how does the song feel? Where is the song going? What can I add to the song to maybe take it from where it is to maybe just up a notch or two? And that may involve a part, a part and a sound, uh, a couple of parts, uh, a concept or two or three parts. It can involve a lot of things, but the, the mindset is the same as what can I do to quickly make this song, hopefully enhance it and take it to the next level. And a lot of musicians, of course, the stars are known for being a little eccentric or flaky. There's not much room for that, I imagine, in being a session guy, right? No, not not at all. I mean, you know, you you the focus is on on the music, and you know, it's all business. I mean, when I started out, studio time was two hundred dollars an hour, you know, so you don't have a lot of time to fool around on somebody else's bill, you know, and uh, so the idea is to be focused and to be ready and to you know be a good listener, uh, a good uh, like they tell you know like you when you're in the fifth uh, in kindergarten and uh, your uh, teacher writes in your report card plays well with others. Well, that's, that's a, that, that's a, a really important key is, is to play well with others and to cooperate and realize that, you know, you may not be the star on this one, you know, and your part may not even be the most important, overtly important part, but it's the, it's like baking a great cake. I mean, nobody would eat baking powder, but the right amount of baking powder makes a great cake too much baking powder makes a terrible cake. Too little baking powder makes a flat cake. So you may be bake. You may not be the frosting on this one. You might be the baking powder. You know. So <laughs> so just realizing that. You know. <laughs>